All right, well, hello and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time this evening to join us for our seminar series here at the ILPC. My name is Norani Lejan and I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre, one of the academic centres at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London. So I expect that some of you already received news and notifications about our centre, but if not, please sign up to our monthly newsletter and follow us on Twitter. But now I am absolutely thrilled to be chairing this fantastic panel and book launch of Transparency, New Trajectories in Law by Dr. Rachel Adams. Our first panelist this evening is Professor Adam Geary. Adam is Professor at Law at Birkbeck College, University of London. He was a visiting professor at the Makerere University, Uganda, the University of Pretoria and the University of Peace, Costa Rica. He is author of The Politics of Common Law, published by Routledge, and Law and Globalization, published by Roman and Littlefield. Next on our panel is Dr. Fulla Adelecki. He is Senior Lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Vistrand, Johannesburg, South Africa. He is a South African trained lawyer whose work focuses on international economic law and human rights, corporate transparency, open government, and accountability within the extractive industry. Prior to joining the South African Human Rights Commission as head of research, Fola was a clinical advocacy fellow at Harvard Law School, supervising clinical projects on business and human rights. Fola was also a Fulbright visiting scholar with the Center for Sustainable Investment at Columbia University. He has clerked at the Supreme Court of Appeal, South Africa, and worked at the Open Democracy Advice Center, where his human rights work has spanned across Africa. He has served as the country researcher for the Open Government Partnership Independent Reporting Mechanism in South Africa and was part of the expert group reviewing the African Union's Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression in Africa. Fola has also produced research for the Carter Centre, the Open Society Foundation and the World Bank. He holds a PhD from Bits University and an LLM degree from the University of Cape Town. Our third discussant this evening is Dr. Richard Danbury. Dr. Danbury is an academic lawyer, a journalist and a former practicing barrister. He directs the MA in Investigative Journalism at City University of London, coordinates Channel 4's Investigative Journalism Training Scheme and is the BBC, BBC excuse me, Advanced Legal Trainer. When a journalist at the BBC, Richard was part of teams that won two Royal Television Society Awards and worked on TV coverage of six general elections. A graduate of both Cambridge and Oxford Universities, he researches in the area of international comparative media law and freedom of speech law. To that end, he is an Associate Research Fellow at the ILPC, the Institute for Advanced Legal Studies, I'm delighted to say, an Associate of the Centre for Intellectual Property and Informational at the University of Cambridge, and an expert at Columbia University's Global Freedom of Expression Project. And last but not all least is the woman of the hour and the author of this fantastic piece of scholarship, Dr. Rachel Adams. Dr. Rachel Adams is a senior research specialist at the Human Sciences Research Council of South Africa and an associate research fellow here at the Information Law and Policy Center. Her research lies at the intersection of philosophy, gender, technology, law, and race, and she has published widely in these fields. Rachel has previously led the work of the South African Human Rights Commission on Civil and Political Rights, including authoring various reports to the United Nations. Dr. Adams is the incoming chair of the Independent Expert Panel of the South African Department of Science and Innovation Center on AI Research, and is leading various projects on artificial intelligence, ethics and policy in South Africa, including the development of a policy brief series on AI, data and ethics, which has been endorsed by the UN Global Pulse. Her work around AI has received funding support from the University of Cambridge, Facebook and the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council. Rachel is also a member of the Independent Advisory Group for the Surveillance Camera Commissioner's Office for the UK for the United Kingdom's Home Office, rather, and an editor of the South African Journal on Human Rights. Her work on gender and AI has been cited, amongst others, by Nature, The Guardian, The New York Times, and by the United Nations. So in terms of the format for this evening, each of the panelists will share their insights and thoughts on Rachel's book. Rachel will then be given the opportunity to respond to their contributions. 
We will then open up the discussion to the digital floor or more accurately, our Zoom webinar format we have here this evening. In terms of recording the event, we would be very grateful if any of the participants would not turn on their cameras while the panel are presenting and also why Rachel is presenting. So we'd appreciate it if you could hold off on turning your cameras on or unmuting until we get to the Q&A section of the seminar. Thank you. So now I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening and invite Adam to begin our discussion whenever you're ready, Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd just like to start by thanking um, uh, Nora and Dali and everybody at the IALS for putting on this event tonight. And I also need to confess something that my uh, my paper that I would like to read to you, which is obviously about Rachel's book, is propped up by a pineapple to my left here. So if I'm looking over here, it's partly because it should be on screen. I've got used to the whole thing being in front of me. So my pineapple paper innovation is, um, it, I hope it doesn't fail. Anyway, what, what I'd really like to begin by saying is what a thrill it is to be here and what an honour it is to speak to you about uh, Rachel's book, which I'm very pleased to say was one of the um, first wave of publications in the new trajectories series. Um, when Colin and I came up with the idea for this series, uh, one of our misgivings was it might be quite difficult, the, the brief that we were hoping our authors would, would write to, which is the idea of the application of theory. So it, it, it demands two things. It demands a facility with ideas and an ability to apply them and to do all that in 50,000 words. And we were both slightly worried, but when we read, read uh, Rachel's manuscript, it was almost as if, you know, our fears were misplaced. We had this fine, fine text with this absolute movement of thought. Um, you know, we're all kind of old hands at this job. To to do something like this in 50,000 words is, is no mean feat. And I think one of the great achievements of this text is that complete movement of ideas, that complete, in a sense, and perhaps this is not quite the right way of putting it, given the theme of the book, but a kind of transparency of prose. Um, and so I want to just try and build these ideas. Now, my understanding, and forgive me, this is, might be a slightly impressionistic response to the book, because my understanding is, of the panel is that some then more concrete themes will be picked up by, uh, by uh, Richard and Fowler. And so hopefully this all works as a, as a, as a suite, if you like. Um, so the starting point for me is a really, truly interesting idea, and that is how to be critical of that which is so ubiquitous, not just a ubiquitous, this idea of transparency, so inherently correct, so much part of good government, go good governance, that it appears to be itself entirely see-through. In other words, here's the problem I think Rachel deals with in an exemplary fashion. How do we see what appears to be entirely see-through? As Rachel notes, the etymology of the term transparency can be reconstructed in the following way, trans, through, or beyond, and pario, to appear, with transparency, therefore, meaning in root, etymologically, uh, to appear through or to make visible. As Rachel then puts it very, very deftly, transparency positions itself as a pure, unmediating medium through which information travels unscathed. Really interesting use of word, I think. This claim that transparency is a pure medium, which does not participate in the representation and interpretation of that which it discloses, is bound up with its claim to truth. And I think we could spend all evening just thinking about that paragraph, but I'm going to move on and try and suggest how these ideas connect together. Because I think it takes us to a paradox. Um, and the paradox, this is the paradox of transparency as articulated in Rachel's book. Quote, instead of resulting in the promised open society, a kind of secularised eschaton, where all could be seen, known and understood, this new level of transparency and the technologies it relies upon has brought about new forms of closure, secrecy and opacity. Transparency has brought about opacity. So the paradox in a more extended form. What we see renders something else invisible. 
how are we going to see that invisible thing? This is the, the, the genealogy that I think is at work in, in Rachel's thinking. It takes us to the following idea, and I'm going to quote again. Transparency functions as a form of power at the level of citizens and individual subjectivity to meet our unwarranted behaviour, producing a homogeneity whose behaviour and even affectations can be anticipated, controlled and capitalised, all under the rubric of the transparent society, whose intentions are, and actions are, an account of its supposed transparency legible to all. So here's my gloss, which I think is a way, again, of just building these ideas, building this conceptual network that, that Rachel's book constructs. So power, which is hard to see, makes us easy to see. It makes us, it makes us, it makes us as subjects of power. I think if I had to summarise Rachel's book in a, in a single line, in a sing, single sentence, I'd say this. It's a genealogy of visibility. So genealogy as a method, as a way of thinking, takes us to Foucault and behind Foucault to Nietzsche. But I think Foucault is the presiding spirit of this book. Foucault's way of working becomes, I think, in, in Rachel's thinking, something like a thickening agent. So that what passes for self-supporting and reinforcing truth, transparent truths through the, the transparency through which truth, truth appears, are, as it were, frozen in order that we can study what holds them in place and thus what holds in place the regime of obvious truth that they sponsor. Rachel cites Foucault's concern with making problems active, with avoiding the question of how things should be and rather getting under the skin, posing problems that bring a kind of foundational complexity to light. So we need to peer into the place where we shouldn't look. Rachel writes against the, quote, the illusion of simplified, accessible, illegible world. And she writes against the smooth circuit of an information economy. Now, this seems to me to resonate with Marx's famous observation about the sign that hangs above the domain of production, no admittance and less on business. Adams has the pride of oh, referring to you by surname. Sorry, Rachel, I kind of uh, move between Rachel and Adams. Rachel has the price of admission into the new information economy, this new sphere of production where false news and digitalized commodities circulate. In this vein, it strikes me that Rachel's genealogy of transparency, which is taken back to the mechanics of the refraction of light in photography, it's part of this kind of etymological, genealogical reconstruction of the idea of transparency, it's bound up with ideology, that camera obscura, that shows us the real world turned upside down, or indeed the very form of the commodity. Reading Rachel, I was reminded of Marx's description of our old enemy in section four of the first chapter of Capital, the fetishism of commodities, because I think this, this book is about fetishism. Quote from Marx, so, um, I'm coming towards the end here, so please uh, forgive me if, if this go, is going on a little. Quote, this is the reason why the products of labour become commodities. Social things whose qualities are at the same time perceptible and imperceptible by the senses. In the same way, the light from an object is perceived by us not as the subjective excitation of our optic nerve, but as the objective form of something outside the eye itself. But in the act of seeing, there is at all events an actual passage of light from one thing to another, from the external object to the eye. There is a physical relation between physical things, but it's different with commodities. And it's this difference that is important, doubly different in the regimes of transparency, the regimes of the spectacle that Rachel is studying. So moving towards my conclusion, for me, one of the great themes that I find announced in Rachel's text is the peculiar logic of commodification. 
whose critique has to be thought through in terms of visibility and invisibility, what can be seen and what hides. I would connect this with a whole movement of analysis in the book that elaborates a thesis about surveillance capitalism and another working through of the logics of commodification and what they conceal, the state and its violence, in brutal summary. The critique of transparency, Rachel's critique of transparency, addresses what we cannot see, or the way in which the sleight of hand trick performed by transparency takes our eye off a form of, quote, epistemic violence, term is Gatry Spivak's, that defines what comes into transparency's view in the first place. What we do not see are the forms of power that have, sell, that have themselves taken hold of transparency in order, quote, to exclude and delimit other realities, and particularly other forms of governance that are not centralised and bureaucratic, to define a reality as that which can be made part of a disclosure record. This is then scaled up to become a much more general critique, but I've not got time, I think, to reconstruct this. So this is really moving towards my last paragraph. So Rachel links the critique of the commodity and the violence of the state with a Foucauldian theme about us. In conclusion, critique, which is far from exhausted, the theme of exhaust the exhaustion of critique is a theme in Rachel's book. The book proves quite the contrary. Critique is far from, ex from exhausted. Has to fight, critique has to fight. Rachel suggests, I think, that critique has to fight on the old terrain. To understand transparency, to understand power, Rachel informs that there is no reductionist or single factor analysis. Thought must grapple with new forms of commodification, with transparency and its tricks, but not forget the state and violence in its, both its symbolic and well as its most brutal and physical forms. It is as if we need to grasp a state informational complex, as well as ourselves as objects of power, as subjects created by forms of power that are so close to us as to be us. It is precisely this gaze into the self that Rachel proposes. How to make us see that the fundamental problem is how we see, is seeing itself. Thank you. Alan, thank you so much. I thought that was really insightful. But before I get drawn in to adding my own thoughts and comments, if uh, Fuller, you could begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's good to see everyone. And um, I'd like to start off by congratulating Rachel on a wonderfully written and researched book. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed um, reviewing this book. Rachel's book is a consummate and critical account of transparency, and it claims that um, scholars, policymakers, and activists often make about its value. The virtues of transparency is often accepted uncritically because, as Rachel describes it in her book, transparency is now an institutionalized and dominant value of modern society. But transparency as a concept is deliberately left undefined by Rachel because of the nebulous nature of the idea and the way it has been co-opted in different forms to advance different claims as she demonstrates across um, three main themes in the book. The first being access to information laws, um, the second global governance, and the third disinformation. Uh, however, for the purposes of developing our critique, Richard describes transparency as denoting the disclosure of information, um, particularly by a powerful group or institution, it more widely suggests a way of behaving such that one's actions and decisions are open to inspection by others. Rachel's hypothesis is that because transparency has become a ubiquitous object and its central claim to openness and the greater liberalization of information in all areas of social and political life today, this means that transparency is opaque and this concept is unraveling. 
And for Rachel, the irony of transparency is that it does not appear to be what it claims to be. And while certain actors deliberately manipulate this idea to advance other hidden interests, there are also unsuspecting victims of transparency's deceit, especially in the global south. This is particularly the case where African governments, for example, are laying claim to legitimacy and good governance by increasingly adopting access to information laws and such laws, regardless of their inefficiency in opening up government and enabling citizen participation in government, have become part of the conditionality for foreign aid in certain countries. The adoption of access to information laws in Africa have also been championed by the African Union through the adoption of a model law on access to information in Africa and the subsequent use of this model law as an advocacy tool by the former Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa. While Rachel does not deal with the role of the African Union as a willing participant in pushing the narrative of transparency as imagined and defined in a homogeneous fashion that Rachel describes in page 12 of, of her book as that which lies beneath the popular discourse of transparency, the structures of power, systems of exclusion, foreclosure of other possibilities and constructions of subjectivity that are inherent in the making and remaking of transparency as a discursive fact. What she does is that she uses other global governance institutions, such as the Open Government Partnership, where I served as a researcher for, for South Africa a few years ago, and she used the OGP in problematizing the transparency conundrum. In critiquing the increasingly popular Open Government pa Partnership, Rachel claims that the transparency claims of the OGP are inherently problematic as they cannot avoid the significant risk that without more, they are doomed to remain only abstract rhetoric, enunciating the ostensible human benefits of a globalized and transparent world society and failing to take account of the growing exclusion and oppression of certain groups and ideas in these monolithic endeavors. So I believe that Rachel's work raises two important considerations that I want to discuss today. First, when transparency is invoked, it is often done alongside the concept of open government or more broadly accountability. And while Rachel acknowledges that her work is beyond the scope of a discourse on the meaning and forms of accountability, it is, to, it is important to understand what a critique of the fallacy of transparency means for future governance. While Rachel does not suggest that the project of open government must be abandoned, she argues that disclosure brought about through mechanisms of transparency must also be understood as a form of interpretation and therefore necessarily must be understood and therefore necessarily must be understood as altering that which is disclosed. I think what is embedded in Rachel's argument here is the idea that the performance of transparency by institutions through the disclosure of information is an act of interpretation which, as she puts it, must be understood as occurring within a chain of interpretation and value inscription as information, which is not neutral or pre-interpretive. It is already always an interpretation. As, as a transparency scholar with previous experience in working in what I would describe as the three coaches of the access to information train, where I was a persistent requester of information on behalf of non-profits in South Africa, and then I became an independent regulator and interpreting and enforcing compliance with access to information laws in South Africa, and then subsequently working for governments where I was processing access to information requests. Rachel's argument is a true reflection of the sanitized practice of the transparency dance that I have witnessed. And as she puts it, the illusion of transparency is that it allows citizens to believe that the forces of power that act upon them are accessible, legible, visible, and trustworthy. But this belief is achieved through the illusion of a transparent society, of an immediacy in the relationship between the state and its citizens, 
and a state that is visible to its citizens produced through the presence of transparency laws and standards and through the calls to and claims for transparency globally enunciated. So if transparency then creates an unattainable promise of accountability, which I think is what Richard is alluding to, what does this mean for democratic projects that are supposedly based on citizen engagement, for which transparency is meant to serve as a vehicle for participation? As Rachel points out, the evolution of transparency discourse can be traced to the human rights discourse, which initially emanated from freedom of expression to what is now increasingly becoming a standalone right of access to information in modern constitutions. While the entanglement of transparency with human rights can create a restrictive understanding, this association, I think, is nevertheless valuable as it compels courts to give meaning to the right of access to information in ways that are meaningful for the realization of the rights of citizens in democratic societies. This then can fulfill transparency's promise, which Rachel describes as a promise far greater than simply liberalized information, and a lot of it, it offers a society that can be seen, known, understood, and even changed by those who are not central to its construction, but they're not so powerful. Transparency offers the promise of a simpler world in which all can participate equally through the shared possession of readily available information and knowledge. Now, for the second consideration that I pulled out for, from Rachel's work for discussion today, while the book considers the issue of transparency and its evolving interpretation, what is not sufficiently addressed and perhaps was beyond the scope of this um, short book is the pivotal moment when a notable shift took place in the adoption of the transparency narrative as equaling open government and accountability, especially in the global south, where Rachel has deliberately situated a uh, brilliant analysis. Understanding this pivotal moment is necessary because, as Rachel puts it, we are in a period of the post-transparent, where in this post-transparency, the notion of transparency no longer refers to its supposed original purpose and objective of making institutions visible in order to make them accountable. Instead, transparency functions as a form of power at the level of citizens and individual subjectivity to met out unwanted behavior, producing a homogeneity whose behavior and even affectations can be anticipated, controlled, and capitalized, all under the rubric of a transparent society whose intentions and actions are on account of the supposed transparency legible to all. In addition, determining this pivotal moment is important given that transparency has not been reduced to a singular form within governments as enabling access to recorded information through access to information laws, a process that is designed to be exclusionary and does not take into account the history of how information was stored and knowledge shared in uncolonized societies. This has resu resulted in what Rachel describes as the demarcation of the boundaries of the signification of knowledge and information such that these other forms of knowledge and information are excluded from the site of meaning in a manifest example of epistemic violence. They are rendered non-information and non-knowledge. So in Rachel's historical and philosophical analysis of transparency, it would appear to me that the pivotal turning point in the brains of the transparency discourse has been a leap beyond the transparency and accountability debate into new domains of governance that cannot be placed within a long history of the evolution of transparency and its philosophical underpinnings. The commonalities of access to information laws on the one hand, and the typical language of transparency by actors in the global north on the other hand, indicate that the pivotal moment for African countries' approaches to transparency has come at the time of their widespread adoption of access to information laws. As a pivot, I believe it also reveals the obstinate influence of global North interests to shape governance in the global South and the declining ability of African states to resist. So while the conscious pivotal moment is not identifiable, what Rachel's analysis reveals is the tragic misfortune that she describes as modern transparency is constituted as a social fact and ethical value 
and that through its true statement, it both creates and reproduces its power, working to shape the social and global reality in which it exists. Furthermore, she states, to this end, the transparency discourse legitimizes regimes of power and subjectivities, which claim to be transparent, and in doing so, delimits and excludes other forms of governance, ways of knowing and ways of being that do not have a claim to transparency or do not follow transparency's prescriptions, particularly as they appear in the global south. Rachel's work also warns us about concerning current developments and the dystopian future that awaits us if we do not act. In a world of digitization and artificial intelligence, we are overwhelmed with the production of information at a pace that we can hardly keep up with, and the traditional gatekeeping of the production and dissemination of information has been dismantled. This has led to, to what Richard describes as two key informational crises. According to her, the first relates the rise of issues such as post-truth, the attention economy, fake news, and deepfakes, which all expose the fallacy of transparency's underlying assumption that information disclosed will be true. And then the second concerns privacy, with the rapid advancement of database technologies and algorithmic processing, data, and particularly personal data. In a time where we see a rise in authoritarian governments in every corner of the globe, where governments are using the law and unchecked powers to determine democracy and weaken civil and political rights. I believe that we should all be concerned that these developments are happening through the practice of information, through the practice of disinformation and the use of surveillance technology. These practices have also weakened the resistance to authoritarianism and institutions meant to check these abuses of power have been subverted. An important aspect of transparency that can be used in resisting this trend, which Rachel deals with, is the significance of whistleblowing. She critiques whistleblowing as lying not so much in what is revealed, as it is already known, but in the act of revelation itself, the significance of which entails both the reiteration of the symbolic terms of transparency to the whistleblower's exomologies and the rearticulation of the depoliticized space of the transparent subject whose knowledge of its acts of truth is concealed or rendered invisible. While Rachel sometimes takes a cynical approach, I think, to the acts of the whistleblower and their virtuous positioning, especially in high-profile cases we have seen in the past, this practice of whistleblowing, I believe, is still incredibly vital in promoting accountability, especially at local levels of governance and, indeed, in some corporate institutions. The last part of Rachel's book invites us to look inwards and cautions against our willing participation in the erosion of our privacy as big tech maximizes the information we voluntarily disclose in our engagement with the digital world to develop algorithms that influence and shape our future choices and beliefs. To do so, we need a right to erasure erasure of our digital footprints. In the African context, Privacy rules are still behind the curve, and urgent regulation that responds to the changing world of data is needed across the continent. So to conclude, Rachel's work, I believe, is a refreshing read and an utilization of philosophy, particularly the work of Foucault, to analyze our subject matter provides a real level of originality. And for scholars like me who are interested in transparency and how we consume and process information in the digital age, at Adam's closing pitch, um, which I, 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 I again like to quote, it should probably be a constant frame, that no longer can it be assumed that information released and received in the public domain is true, real, objective. No longer can transparency be assumed to foster trust in institutions and strengthen democracy. No longer can it be assumed that the society we live in can be understood and assessed by those who do not hold the reins of power. Uh, the fallacies of transparency are coming undone marks what she describes as the post-transparent a society where the call to transparency continues, but its claims cannot be realized in part because transparency has already been achieved and its realization has been definitely opaque. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bella. That was a really impressively comprehensive critique, not just, I think, of the philosophical underpinnings of Rachel's work, but also I think you highlighted the the applied critique, you know, to the specific case studies of disinformation, 
access to documents, open open governance, and how essentially transparency as a principle and as a tool, as Rachel's book, you know, goes into great detail about it's it's not the silver bullet, you know, it does have a clear link with accountability, but often that link is is widely overstated and exaggerated because then that takes away from other safeguards and mechanisms that would greatly improve the actual context of that information because as Rachel highlights information doesn't necessarily mean knowledge it doesn't it doesn't tell you exactly what this interpretation of that information that has been shared actually means for that relationship between organizations between the individual and government and also that of corporations but again I mean there's so many fantastic um, ideas and debates raised by the book but before I get drawn in even more I'd like to pass over to Richard for his thoughts. Richard, whenever you're ready, thank you. So while Richard is just getting ready to respond, it's the technical difficulties we all have in these COVID times. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. You wouldn't Whenever... believe how stupid I've just been. I had something sitting on the the, lap, the, the, the keyboard, so it didn't actually um, unmute when I thought I would. Um, right, assuming you can all hear me, I'll crack on. Please, someone, if you wave at me like this, if you can't hear, I'll switch. Um, Rachel, I really... You just wrote it for me. Um, the reason I thought you wrote it for me is because I'm um, degrees in philosophy, and, in the two, and I've got Nietzsche. Um, uh, and my unhealthy Nietzsche interest in Nietzsche has bled through Foucault into your book. So you're approaching this from a kind of genealogical uh, and archaeological point of view is I thought was absolutely a cracking way of doing it. And um, there's a phrase in Nietzsche, which people may or may not know that um, Nietzsche described himself as philosophizing. And I kind of feel uh, attacking the notion of. There we are. Yeah. So I was saying that I this to be uh, Rachel attacking the notion of transparency with a hammer, uh, rather like Nietzsche attacked uh, bits of the notion of truth and uh, and morality with a hammer. Um, and it's absolutely necessary and absolutely worthwhile. Uh, and I think the key insight uh, and uh, uh, an extended uh, like this pretty defense uh, uncontestable. Is the revelation is that the notion of is being used as a tool as a and it's a weapon in different different areas to, to uh, bring about ends which aren't necessarily the ends which people think uh, that are going to be brought about through transparency. I'm, I'm very pleased that Fola mentioned the the instance which I'd picked up on as well, which Rachel mentions, of how some African countries have used access to information laws as a way of gaslighting everyone into thinking that they actually do uh, recognize some of the values which are uh, important underneath uh, um, uh, the concept of transparency. Um, and this is, I think, part of the ideological use of transparency, which, which um, Rachel, um, through Foucault, manifests, uh, d demonstrates quite so well. So I think that's my starting point. Uh, my starting point is, is, um, is admiring and recognizing how, how she uh, demonstrates Transparency. Um, our biggest criticism. She stops to. She stops. Uh, really, good at, she would carry on. Um, Ninety-two is when she starts talking about the interesting questions about which she, she which she couches in the. Foucault in terms of resistance, um, about what to do, what to do with this weird phenomenon that we've identified, that, that this term transparency has been, uh, um, uh, has been weaponized and used in a way which is no longer entirely helpful. Um, 
And I think, although I haven't read much Foucault, but I've read Nietzsche, um, that Foucault in this sense is a little bit, my understanding gathered from Rachel, is a little bit like Nietzsche in that he's really good at knocking things down with a hammer, but really bad about building things up in a place, in a place afterwards. And that's kind of where I was particularly interested in going. And I was struck by a passage which Rachel quotes right at the beginning of the book. Dictate how I try and problems to make them in such a city speak for others. Now, I kind of think that uh, Foucault's kind of got it wrong there. I'm not saying Rachel's got it wrong because I think uh, Rachel is not necessarily agreeing with Foucault in that. And I think that's kind of a negative interpretation of law, um, uh, the law in the sense of uh, talking for others. And it's also a negative restrict onwards have pointed out creates rules and it invites people to do things that they wouldn't be able to apply to my that if you paint lines on a football match and create rule sorry if you if you paint lines on a park on a grass on a law piece of lawn if you paint lines on it and you create rules then you have created um a, a, a something different from a park you've created a game of football and the creation of the game of football has come through rules now rules or laws can be facilitative so in this sense um, what I was um, really interested in towards the end of the book, and Rachel is engaging with this on page 91 and 92, where she starts talking about Birchall. What I'm interested in is what do we do with this? How do we turn this into some sort of um, usable uh, legal structure or, or international governance structure to bring about the, the undoubted benefits that can arise from uh, trans do with it i think that's the, the main question i would uh like to 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 ask rachel is 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 you know how do we how do we uh learn from the insights of her book uh into um uh changing the legislation or changing the way uh that states interact with each other and i think just to extend that the one of the things I was interested in as well in that is particularly in this work of virtual in the last bit is is the relationship between um, transparency and opacity um, and how they are in fact two sides of a similar coin and to this extent I was wondering about taking a genealogical survey further back than Rachel did in her I think it's in her second chapter um, it's her first and second chapter and I was thinking about going Uh, of Scamagnot, which for those pre love how it uh, made unlawful to speak ill of the great men of the realm. Um, and here you have an idea about opacity, and here you have an idea about how opacity is actually beneficial and beneficial to society as a whole because. Um, if, if you don't uh, undermine better and more effective early modern and if you care at enlightenment, be different in transparency and the relative merits of untransparency and opacity. Um, and I just throw that in because that's exactly the point where the book stops uh, in, in looking at the two flip sides of the two concepts. So there we are. Um, uh, uh, I, I was uh, I, I must apologize for the fact that you aren't seeing me and I must apologize for the fact that I broke up. But I was um, very enthused by the book. Uh, it's really good to 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 um, to see someone take a Nietzschean hammer uh, to a well accepted legal concept. Um, but my question I think I leave you with is, where do we go from now? Uh, when are you going to publish the next one? That's it. That's it. So, wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard. Um,
there's my goodness, Rachel. I mean, there's there's so much there's so much to respond to there. Um, that I, I'll just make your task as author just that little bit trickier. I'll just add in very quickly uh, my own my own thoughts. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean it's a fantastic book, and you know to cover as much as you have, you know, within that you know that fifty thousand words rubric that Adam mentioned earlier on, because it's the nature of the series, you know, is just you know, it's such an achievement. And at the same time, you know, I suppose you leave us all in this position, as Richard said, of of wanting more, you know, where where do we go from here? You know, second edition, Adam, that's what we're all thinking. We want to know where the solutions, you know, move on from here. And, you know, I think this really is such a fantastic moment, Rachel, for this book, when I look at your book and then related scholarship in the area, Frank Pascal, his his work on transparency, the Black Box Society, you know, he's, you know, he's also addressing those questions, you know, that you raise at the end of your book in terms of recognizing that this isn't a a society without power dynamics, you know, it's not neutral of surveillance capitalism, it's not neutral of that pre-existing relationship between the individual and the state and all the imbalances of values and powers therein. And just very quickly, um, in his new book, New Laws of Robotics, he has an added law to Isaac Asimov's laws. And it really spoke to me when I saw it, when I was thinking of your book, because one of his you know, new suggested laws is that robots and AI systems need to be required to indicate the identity of their creators, controllers and owners. And it just made me think about the arguments that you're making towards the end of your book in terms of where we go now in terms of opera. I'm, I'm going to trip over this word. I, I, I knew I would of making operable opera operator opera, opera, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it like that of making real there we go of making real you know this high level legal and ethical concept of transparency when we break it down into procedural safeguards to give it legal teeth you know where do we go from here you know so we can have those benefits that Richard was talking about earlier in terms of empowering individuals citizen engagement like Fuller mentioned earlier on how do we create that link you know by actually delivering on that promise that normative promise that transparency can actually provide a meaningful link to accountability how do we build more towards that that strengthened paradigm um thank you so much I mean I think just to um, thank you all for, for your comments and, and for reading the book. Um, there are people here that were incredibly instrumental to this book being produced in the first place, Follow really being one. And I really want to just take a moment to, to explain Follow in my history. So I started out working under Follow in the Promotion of Access to Information Unit at the South African Human Rights Commission in 2012, 2013. And Fala said to me, you know, this concept of transparency, it's a really big thing. It's a really important concept. And I hadn't really heard of it before then, or hadn't thought meaningfully about it. And he sort of said, you know, you should, you should read about it. And me reading about it led to me thinking about doing a PhD on this. And Fala was so instrumental in in linking me to the University of Cape Town where I eventually did this PhD and did this work. So I I want to acknowledge that history because it's really important to to how, where we are today. Um, And I am a thinker. I'm somebody that thinks very deeply about an idea and thinks on an idea. And I've been sitting with this idea of transparency for almost seven years now. And my ideas on it have become more complex and possibly less forgiving. And I'm going to start with the question that we've ended up with, which is, where do we go from here? Um, And I can only really answer where I go from here. Um, And I think over time, I've become more and more ingrained as a Foucauldian scholar. And there's one line that that he has said that has stuck with me. Um, and stuck with me as, as somebody whose work is in a human uh, sciences research council. I, I work in a research council where I am supposed to, as part of my job, inform policy. 
So generate these kind of normative ideas and solutions to problems. And Foucault says, I care not to determine how things should be, but how things are. And that has always been how I have approached my work and the value of my work. I see critique as a form of action, as a form of politicizing something, and as a form of bringing an idea to a head. So I, Richard, I didn't catch absolutely everything you said um, because the line was a bit funny, but I, I, in some ways I'm going to reject this metaphor of knocking an idea down with a hammer. What I want to do is build transparency up build it up so it comes to this moment of criticalization where it starts to reveal itself. Um, it starts to reveal the hidden, deceitful problematics that are going on within its discourse, and it starts to break. Um, and Adam, you said something really interesting at the beginning about the transparency of what I was trying to write, and I think that that is precisely it. Um, when I got to towards the end of this project, I started thinking about what is the for, what am I doing here? I think, I think every scholar gets to that point in their work of trying to think about and then trying to articulate what it is they are doing. And I realized that in trying to make transparent transparency, I was doing this kind of parody, a parody of its terms. Um, and it's something that I haven't yet written about, but that I plan to, because I think this idea of parody and critique, but particularly a critique of transparency as a form of parody that sits alongside the object of its critique and tries to undo it within its own terms. It has an important power and it has an important power when you are writing from the global south and writing into this post-colonial canon and this decolonizing kind of objective where you're always polemically kind of writing against something but from within it so in terms of where do we go from here i think that the practicalities of that are less clear as i i mean i began this this work with follow we, we, were, we were faced with this, this access to information law in South Africa that was not really working, but it was highly cherished. It was seen as something really, really important, and it was. It was a really important law for constitutional democracy. It was a really important law for a post-apartheid democracy. Um, but it wasn't being used in a way that was useful or serving the ends that it sought to serve. Um, and as I began to look into this idea of transparency and did this PhD within a law faculty, it became so apparent that this went far beyond law, that, trans that law was merely a technology of transparency rather than transparency being a technology of law. And so to change this, to try and move towards, well, I think this idea of post-transparency must itself be critiqued. And I'm interested in thinking more, more carefully about that. But in moving towards, in moving, moving away from the problematic that has been identified, we have to recognize the ubiquity of this idea and where this ubiquity is produced, how it is produced in all the different spheres. I mean, as, as Richard was kind of alluding to, and, and again, Richard, I didn't catch everything you said, but there is all sorts of different genealogies of the idea of transparency that could have been taken. Um, it has a long history in various respects, but largely, at least identifiably, within a Western canon. And this was also partly my problem, because I came back to South Africa in 2019 and came back to a, a stronger commitment to work against the dominance of the Western canon. Um, so, I mean, just thinking about this in terms of, I think it was, Richard, you can correct me here, but you'd mentioned, it was it a Greek law where it was, wrong to speak ill of persons in power and it was also wrong to speak ill of a immoral past and this idea of not speaking about something 
um, holds a particular history and ethics in South Africa, in apartheid South Africa, and in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where there was a legal precedence that met with a kind of moral and theological um, objective to forgive and to give amnesty to people who had committed wrongs during apartheid. And this amnesty was both a remembrance and a saying and a truth telling of what had happened. And therefore, through this truth telling, you were allowed to be granted amnesty, you were forgiven, and we can move towards this society. But there's also a relationship between, in Greek, between amnesty and amnesia, and then this idea of forgetting and not producing an archive and, and the ethics of not remembering and not speaking about something and not producing a record. So for me, I find all these ideas really, really interesting. And, and my main aim uh, in all of this was to simply problematize a concept that had been completely taken as a given, completely presented as unquestionable. And more than that, it was presented as immoral to question it. Lawrence Lessig has said, who can possibly be against transparency? Its virtues are so pressingly obvious. And, and that was for me so important to, to engage with, this idea that you cannot critique it. It was already, always already prevented from being critiqued. So its forms of power were massive and delimited in advance. I just want to say one more thing about the global South and South Africa and the point that, that I was making here. And it was not quite, my concern wasn't to say that South Africa have sort of used transparency to claim itself and its own status. My, my concern was the ways in which this idea from the global north had been positioned on the global south in order to make the global south legible to the global north and therefore controllable and exploitable. And I think with the transparency, the, the, the morphing of this idea of transparency from access to information and something that was quite instrumental, it was about access to records, to this generalized idea of openness. And then the problematics with, trans, with privacy, which is the sort of flip side, but sort of not the flip side. I think this idea of making the global South transparent to the global North in order to produce forms of extraction, that, that was the problematic that I wanted and that I hope to articulate a little bit more clearly. Um, I'm worried, deeply worried about the idea of homogeneity, the idea of producing a society that is all the same and completely seeable and the, the forms of control um, that go into that, the forms of subjectivity that create a mold to which we must all um, uh, aspire. I, I think that there's a very strong racializing impulse there that I certainly began to critique and, and outline in, in my PhD, but there wasn't room to do it here. A relationship based on this idea of homogeneity between transparency and whiteness and making white, making visible two forms of power. So that is where I'm going next, which is not really very helpful in talking about how we procedurally embed transparency in, um, in legal, in legal, in legal uh, frameworks. I see the value in it, um, but I I think it's such a it's such a key buzzword for policy precisely because of this idea of simplification that transparency claims to make simple society and policies are all about trying to simplify or present a societal issue in a simpler way in order to then manage and govern that issue. So I think that's part of why it's been so popular and is increasingly popular term in any policy, whether it's in to do with environmentalism and climate change or violence against women or whatever it might be. So I think I'll end there, but just to say thank you to you all for, for such insightful comments and, and for taking the time to engage with this work. It's, it's deeply appreciated. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to maybe 
um, support Richard for one second. You know, I'm, I'm going to be team lawyer and say that, you know, don't don't give up on us entirely in terms of what the rule of law can actually do for the concept of transparency. Uh, certainly within a European human rights law framework, I think that, you know, so often these concepts they can be they can be manipulated and they can be utilized for all kinds of different purposes but within a particular framework like european human rights law where you have established doctrines like the rule of law that make real make prescriptive safeguards like accessibility and foreseeability and independent oversight which disrupts you know which challenges that that power dynamic of surveillance capitalism and that relationship between the state and the individual, I think you know there is there are possibilities there, you know, for a more you know constructive way in which transparency can be one mechanism. And I do stress, you know, one mechanism in effective governance that actually does involve the citizen, like Fuller mentioned, and perhaps doesn't go down, you know, that despairing, you know, route of Foucault that you know, Adam, you know, highlighted earlier on. But I mean, this is this is the worst event to be a chair of. I don't want this discussion to end. This is really quite heartbreaking. But unfortunately, we are running. We've actually run over time. But in my mind, that was very worth it. But I wonder if if the panelists wouldn't mind if we held on for just one more moment so that Lawrence, one of our attendees, could could provide a contribution for Rachel. Lawrence, are you there? Uh, yes, I am indeed here. Um, uh, thanks, Nora. Look, I will be uh, very quick in that case. Um, one is, I, so Rachel, this is, you're, I think, blessed with not being concerned with the ref in terms of the UK government's research uh, assessment exercise. I spent an awful lot of time this year reading ref outputs um, and looking at, you know, well, what is it that breaks new ground in the scholarship? And when I I don't currently own your book, but I have got it on the list for the library to buy. Um, so it's one more copy. Uh, but it really struck me looking at it that this was something that did really interesting and different things with transparency. Um, and, it, and it certainly, as I looked at it, I was like, this, this is just, it looks, from what I've seen in the discussion tonight, makes me think it, a huge contribution to the scholarship. Um, in terms of the defending team lawyer, to use Nora's words there, um, I think some of it is also about the conceptualization of what legal scholarship is. And I don't know if maybe that's a distinction between how legal scholarship is viewed in South Africa um, and how it's viewed here in the UK. Um, but I feel that the breadth of legal scholarship, that idea that it's going beyond law, whereas I would kind of see the whole Foucauldian analysis actually is just now not being a part of what all lawyers are doing, but I feel, it, I feel it's much more embedded within things. But my question, and I don't think I com feel compelled to answer it given the time, my question is partly for you and for Fowler and for Richard as well, which is if you were giving evidence to a parliamentary committee, it's a variation on Richard's question of well, where do we go from here, but if you were giving evidence to a parliamentary committee and the chair of that committee says, You've written a really scholarly book here, which has some really quite obviously significant insights into how we under trans understand transparency. You know, that proposition, as Adam described earlier, transparency is brought about opacity. If they're to ask you, can you just tell us what do we as a parliamentary committee scrutinising the work of corporations, scrutinising government, and yet ourselves trying to make parliament transparent? Um, what should we do with this? Is there a lesson we should really take out of your book, whether in the form of a question or a or, or, or a task for us? And I don't know when, and I reason I asked Follower and Richard as well, is they might each have different senses of what, from you, different people could take out different things. So I don't know if you've got time to answer that. I'll leave that in Nora's hands. Okay. Thank you so much, Lawrence. What a fantastic question. And I'm so proud of Team Lawyer right now. Just just want to put that out there. Um, if that if it's okay with the panel and with Rachel, could we maybe 
wrap everything up, if I could go round the panel, start with Adam, Fola, and then Richard, if you could all take a minute or two each to conclude any final thoughts for Rachel and to respond to Lawrence's question. And then if I could leave final thoughts and remarks with Rachel. So Adam, could we start with you? Certainly, I'd like to quote Gramsci. Um, pessimism of the, uh, sorry, I got it the wrong way. Pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. The whole question of the blueprint, I don't think is addressed by this book at all. It, it's a provocation. I think it passes the baton to other people. And I think to partly speak for and partly to speak against Team Lawyer in the spirit of Rachel's book, I'd say it's a question of who, where the struggle is and who's engaging in the struggle. And I'd like to raise the issue of tax secrecy. The whole point of Rachel's book is it's who sees what. We as informed citizens need to see the amount of wealth that is stashed away offshore and to which law seems to be at the moment relatively toothless. And behind the whole Brexit charade is, of course, the way in which the European Union were making much more solid moves on this than the British government were. So the question of transparency, as, you know, even like Gramsci or Marx would say, it's a question where how the forces play themselves out, who the actors are, who the players are. And there are some good lawyers, and this is certainly not thrown out the law, nor as I think, I think Foucault's got slightly bad press here. This is what Rachel would call counterpower. Counterpower is struggle. It's a question of finding those points where you can make a difference. And that is a question of an active politics. No book can deal with that. That's the book can simply provoke. And so to me, the question that we're kind of posing at Rachel's text, it's already kind of danced off ahead of us. And it's saying, you you work it out. I'm setting up the problem. This is now a task for engaged lawyers who have the skills, who have the knowledge, who have the networks to start thinking and acting in the way that I am inviting you to do so. So to me, it's that it's that fantastic, whether you want to say that's a Nietzschean provocation, a Foucauldian provocation or a Marxist provocation, it's all of them. And that's what's so brilliant about this book. Thank you, Adam. Yes, I think, yes, provocation, counterpower, that is certainly what we want to encourage within any thriving democracy. Paula. Thank you. Building on from what Adam just said about who sees what, I recall a few years ago reading um, Les biography where he said one of the worst decisions of his administration was to pass the Freedom of Information Act. It genuinely shows that um, if access information laws are used the right way by the right actors, it could potentially be a powerful tool in holding public and private institutions ac accountable. And building on from what Adam says about who sees what, I think it's ultimately about how do you have a targeted form of oversight in different spaces. So Adam spoke about tax, spoke about tax secrecy in the extractive industry. There's been a whole big um, debate and push for new policies relating to beneficial ownership transparency, which um, can potentially be effective, but I think ultimately it's about taking the power away from causing the information and being able to have a more um, rough and sanitized disclosure of information that regulators can properly use to, um, to, to, to hold both public and private institutions accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. Richard, whenever you're ready. I hope I can start properly about that earlier on. I'm glad that uh, quoted the great Nietzschean, uh, Marxian scholar Tony Blair, um, because I have, I have the exact quote in front of me here, and it is this, freedom of information, three harmless words. I look at those words as I write them, and I feel like shaking my head till it drops off my shoulders. You idiot, you naive, foolish, irresponsible nincompoop. There really is no description of this stupidity, no matter how vivid, that is adequate. I quake at the imbecility of it. Um, so I kind of leave that ringing in my ears. If Tony Blair thinks it's a bad idea, then I think it might be a good idea. Um, and to segue onto that, to try and answer Lawrence's question, I think what I might do with this, um, the essential insight I've taken from Rachel's book, is to beware 
the uh, bewitchment of thought uh, by language, to quote Wittgenstein, because we're all getting pompous here, um, and it's of uh, politics, pol more or less, uh, concept of currency. In other words, what you need to do is you have to look at the acts and you look at how they are working in practice, in action, then needs to be sort of, as there is in this country, the Institutes of Governance, uh, and in other countries there are um, other NGOs, there needs to be someone seeing if this is used in a weaponized sense or if it's actually bringing about the societal goods which we hope it brought about. So that's what, that's the way I would direct the book, but it's not my book to direct. Rachel, would you like to give a response and conclude proceedings for us? Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to make something quite clear. I'm not critiquing transparency. I'm critiquing the discourse of transparency. I'm cri critiquing how transparency is spoken about and what is said. So just to make that clear, I think what I would say to parliamentarians or to people looking for a quick answer is that transparency is not a panacea, uh, nor is it neutral. And there is a complex relationship between transparency and accountability. Accountability generally implies to hold power to account, which is the general purpose of the rule of law. Whereas what I'm trying to show is that transparency is not a kind of neutral tool for achieving either of these ends. Transparency holds within it its own mechanisms and histories of power that have all sorts of effects in all sorts of ways in all sorts of parts of the world. So I just wanted to make the idea more complex. That, that was my kind of simple uh, uh, sell for the book to begin with. But thank you all so much. It's been a really wonderful evening talking about, um, talking about this and very selfishly fun to talk about your own work and your own ideas for an hour. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, I think that just leaves it to me to give huge thanks to our panel who gave some really, really fantastic insights for Rachel's book and to thank Lawrence and for everyone who attended this evening for the discussion, for the very rich questions. And most of all, to thank Rachel for producing this really fantastic piece of scholarship so original, so daring on counter power. And you know what? I think, I think team lawyer will give you our blessing. We'll give you our blessing, Rachel. The second edition doesn't, you know, have to, have to be for us. You know, there's plenty of critical discourse to pursue in this area. And I think that will be another fantastic piece of scholarship that I'm very much looking forward to already. So Congratulations again. And it really has been wonderful to discuss the book with you and all of the provocations and debates that it raises. And I look forward, hopefully, in the not so distant future of getting a, an autograph book and hopefully of uh, seeing you all soon um, in the in the in the fantastic year that will be 2021. So, yes, thanks, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye bye.